Welcome to uh, my capstone presentation. I'm super excited to present what I've been working on for the last year or so. Um, so yeah, my capstone uh, is called Redeeming God's Name, Discovering the Biblical Storyline Through an Honor-Shame Lens. So first I'm just going to lay out a little bit of how I got here. Um, what, what the path was to get me to this place and um, why, why I chose to do this, this capstone project. So pre-Sattler, I knew that I was interested in connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I, I was starting to figure out that I loved studying the Bible. Um, and I taught a little bit of Firm Foundations Curriculum, Creation to Christ in Tanzania. And so that was kind of my first, my first introduction to this idea of, of teaching through the storyline of the Bible. But it wasn't until I started classes at Sattler that I was gripped by biblical theology in, in the first semester in fundamental texts. And then the next summer I spent hours listening to Bible Project and reading N.T. Wright, and um, became just super fascinated with this concept of seeing the gospel, seeing, seeing the biblical as a united whole, as, as more of a story and, and less of a bunch of propositions and, and facts. Um, and then in my Christian doctrines class, instead of writing a proper doctrines paper for, for that class, I actually wrote a biblical theology paper on image bearing, and um, and I was I was super fascinated by this concept of of who humans were created to be, and how that runs through the storyline of Scripture. Then classes like Isaiah, New Testament use of the Old Testament with Dr. Schumann, um, and Galatians and biblical theology with Dr. Lamachella just further fueled my interest in the story of the Bible. And then in Dr. Lamachella's missiology class, I wrote my final paper on telling the story of the Bible as mission, basically arguing that, um, that as Christians, as, as people who follow Christ and, and have the, the inspired word of God, that we should read this as a story and live into the story and that the story of the Bible has worldview reshaping, reframing um, power. And as we live into that story, it shapes who we are as people. <clears throat> Sometime early in my junior year, I started co-leading a small Tuesday evening Bible study at the bridge with Swan Tuong and learned to love reading and exploring the Bible. With a, with a small group of people, um, Christian or non-Christian, that also wanted to learn more about the Bible. Then early last summer, Tim Kipfer and I started doing a Saturday Bible study uh, with a group of mostly Chinese friends. And we decided to kind of merge the concepts of discovery Bible studies, the, the discovery Bible study method, and the story of the Bible approach that I was excited about. And so we, we started with this group of, I think it was four kind of core participants, Tim and I, and then there, was, there were others that were in and out some. Um, and we started at the beginning of the Bible and worked our way through the story, hitting on kind of milestones of, of the biblical story like creation, fall, Noah, Abraham, David, etc. It was, it was awesome. It, it got me really fired up. I loved it. Um, and so then that kind of brought me to the point of like, all right, I need to choose a capstone now. And so there were these kind of big ideas that I was excited about. Um, discovery Bible studies or something close to that. Um, the the world f world view reframing meta narrative of scripture, and 
as I started talking to Tim and the experience in my, in my Bible study at the bridge with the, with the Chinese people, I realized that um, there's a need for this with the India team going to India and, and Tim saying, hey, I would love to have something like this a little more formal, formalized, put into a curriculum form. Um, and I had heard a little bit about honor-shame concepts, <coughs> excuse me, honor-shame concepts and some of that. And so the third element of that, the third element of that was um, the, the Eastern audience piece. Before I kind of honed in on these three, I, I knew I wanted to do something with the biblical meta narrative, and I was thoughticulating is my new word. I was thoughticulating about creating a sequel to Christie's Kingdom of Priests study um, on a different theme of the Bible. But as I was talking to her about that and thinking about it, um, there, there were multiple reasons why I decided not to do that. And one was it didn't seem like Daughters of Promise would be that excited about helping me publish <laughs> something. <laughs> so uh, decided not to go that route. Um, Tim thought the process of our Bible study was really effective and said he would love if I would prepare something for them. Um, and so I realized that I would have the benefit of actually testing the product and sharpening it with the study that I had already started and I could count what I'm already doing as capstone hours. So I saw that as a great fit. It also offered me the chance to explore more than one theme from a higher level and not be only focused on, on one particular theme of the Bible. Um, I see this as a positive because I see myself engaging in biblical theology for the rest of my life and it seemed like doing something a little bit broader would give me tastes of multiple themes and kind of help me figure out what am I really interested in. I'm not sure if it did that, but I do have a strange fascination with exile as a standalone theme now. So we'll see where that goes. So the first piece that I did, um, here's the, the four products that came out of this are a research paper where I researched method, content, and context for the study. Um, the, I created 25 Bible studies that go through the story of the Bible. Um, and then I created a, an accompanying one page of facilitator notes for each study. And finally I created, or I, I wrote a journal with the classes that I facilitated um, to kind of create a product for for the, um, the Bible studies that, that I facilitated at the bridge and to inform how I wrote the rest of my, my content. So starting with research, I found this, I, I started l last semester by researching and writing to first see if this, if this was a project that I was interested in and second to determine the themes and contours of the project. I started researching how biblical theology and Eastern worldviews slash cultures, they, how they overlap, and effective ways to communicate the story of the Bible in this context. Dr. Lamachella pointed me to Jackson Wu's book, One Gospel for All Nations, A Practical Approach to Biblical Contextualization. His conclusion, Wu's conclusion is that um, he, he argues for what he calls a firm but flexible model of contextualization, and he concludes that three themes are consistently tied to gospel throughout the Bible, creation, kingdom, and covenant, and that these should be our firm center, our unchanging center of contextualizing the, the biblical story, like the hub of a wheel, and then other themes kind of revolve around that and are more flexible, more like the the tire, the rubber tire on the wheel. 
Wu's podcast, Doing Theology, Thinking Mission, and especially a conversation he had with Bobby Gupta, an Indian theologian and seminary president, reinforced the importance of biblical theology for India, for, on my part. <clears throat> and then I also spent quite a bit of time researching um, honor, shame, as I was looking for ways to communicate the Bible more compellingly to people with Eastern worldviews, the, the honor-shame dynamics of most Eastern cultures was soon very apparent. June loaned me this great book uh, by Jason Georges and Mark D. Baker, Ministering in Honor-Shame Cultures. Um, they have just a ton of information in this book. First, they, they go through the whole biblical storyline and point out how honor shame is central to the to the Bible and then just lots of practical uh, instructions on evangelism and conversion and um, ministry and, and lots of different things um, but Eastern or, or honor shame cultures even though there's there's lots of honor shame cultures they're not all the same uh, for example Japan and the Middle East are both strongly honor shame cultures but in Japan, group harmony is extremely important, and honor is gained through win-win agreements and ensuring all parties are pleased, while shame is covered or exiled. In contrast for the Islamic Middle Eastern cultures, honor is most commonly regained through revenge and honor killings, thus removing the shameful party altogether and uh, regaining honor in that way. Uh, and then in India, despite outlawing the caste system, there's still a lot of honor-shame dynamics. There's, there's a great shame and deep abhorrence of low caste pollution and a great concern for purity. So in the Bible, we find honor and shame everywhere. God created Adam and Eve with great honor as image bearers of his reputation and rulers over his creation. And in Genesis 3, it is shame that Adam and Eve feel after they rebel rather than guilt. To remove the pollution of sin and shame, God exiles them from his presence. The contest over who will make a great name for, for whom in the adjacent stories of Babel and Abraham so there, there's these two stories right next to each other. Both of them are concerned with making a great name. And th there we find the people of Babel yet again grasping for honor and, and trying to make a great name for themselves. While in the next story, God chooses a nobody and says, I'm going to make a great name out of you. Um, He says he will make a great name for himself out of Abraham's seed. And then Israel goes on to greatly dishonor God's name, doesn't keep the third commandment by carrying God's name for nothing. And that essentially this whole concept of, of carrying God's name, they severely misrepresent God's name to the nations. And God's reputation is, is at stake and is harmed. So God exiles them from his dwelling place in Jerusalem. And as Daniel says, they are covered in shame with exile. But then Jesus comes and carries God's name as it was meant to be carried. And he reverses shame everywhere he goes. He cleans the outcast lepers, heals the woman with a flow of blood, teaches stories like the prodigal son reversal of status, where, where the son is restored to honor. He teaches a countercultural honor code in the Beatitudes, where the poor, humble, merciful, and lowly are actually the ones God honors instead of the wealthy, influential, etc. And then he honors his father at the end and dies a shameful death on the cross, bearing the shame of Israel and humanity's sin on himself, and is sent into the exile of death by his father. But because he honored his father perfectly, God reverses his status and gives him all honor and authority over the earth and crowns him king. The church is called to follow 
his humble serving example with the result that we too, who bear God's image faithfully here and now, will also be raised up and brought into God's presence once more. And as the end of Revelation says, his name will be on our forehead. We will then be given the honor of co-ruling the creation with God and the Lamb once more. This is a graph from, from George's and Baker's book on just the concept of, of redemption and how redemption is multifaceted in different cultures. And so it's not to say that one or the other is more correct. It's just to say this is multifaceted, multidimensional. And it's really interesting to, to think about uh, salvation in these kind of different perspectives. Honor and shame, purity and pollution, status reversal, father, son, adoption, allegiance, community, all of these concepts are, are very, very important for honor, shame contexts. The third piece of my research was study method. How am I going to go about um, designing these studies? And what, what way can I do it most effectively? I wanted to communicate the story of the Bible effectively, but also involve participants well. As a meta narrative nerd, I really wanted to make sure the dots are being connected through the Bible and that themes are being developed throughout the study. I found out pretty quickly that I wasn't a big fan of the pure discovery Bible study method, um, partially because there's there's no teaching involved. It can be a group of people without anybody who actually really knows the Bible. Um, and there's a really, really high emphasis on obedience, even when, even, even in passages that aren't necessarily calling for action. Um, there's, there's a high emphasis on, on acting something out of every study, which isn't always a bad thing, but um, it can tend to kind of lead towards this more works-based um, response. Secondly, as, as I was proposing this introduction of the Bible, um, or as I was proposing this as an introduction to the story of the Bible, who didn't know it at all or, or very little of it, I also didn't think that the inductive Bible study was a great approach because that's generally works better for people who already know the Bible to, to some extent. Um, I was influenced by Robert Mueller who wrote the, messenger, the Message, the Messenger in the Community. And I determined that some level of teaching from, his, from what he was recommending, that a, a teaching is really necessary following the example of Jesus and Paul and, and others in scripture. It seems that with evangelism, with, with new believers, that teaching is really important. But I didn't want to have a teacher-dominated approach where the teacher explains what the passage means apart from the student's observations and is somewhat disconnected from the students relationally. So I landed on what I'm calling the facilitator-participant Bible studies. This imitates a lot of the format for the Discovery Bible Studies with a few key changes. I was inspired to do this by Ficker and Capek's book, A Field Guide to Becoming Whole. They say that especially for Westerners, the tendency is to simply impart knowledge um, as, the teacher, as a teacher to the students, instead of inviting participants in to share power, responsibility, and personal experiences in the learning environment. So I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more below, or later. All right, so here's what, the, here's what a study looks like. Um, admittedly, format was not my primary concern at this point of the process. So this is, this is one of the studies um, from Mark. Each study is laid out with this kind of four-section 
um, format. First, at the top, you have the study steps. So this is the same on every study. And basically, uh, as you walk through those, it kind of walks you through the rest. So the first one is, is share. What are you thankful for? What caused you stress this week? That comes from the Discovery Bible Study Method. And essentially, that's a way to kind of break the ice, pull people in, create a little bit of community. Um, I think as I, as I continue working with this, there's pieces of that of those steps that I'll probably modify some. But I found that really, really helpful with my group. It was often really hard to keep that section small because people would get started talking about all the, all the tough things that they're going through and like family, internal family conflict or relationships. And I found myself like, well, I'm not really a counselor here. <laughs> but um, it was, it's a great way to kind of create community and and voice things and, and talk with each other about each other's lives. Second is remember, so recalling the last study and sharing how you applied it or who you shared it with, how you, it's basically like, what did you do with that? And the, the main thing for me here was just the kind of spaced repetition of recalling it really cements it more in people's minds. <clears throat> The third piece is context. So this is, this is the study, short study context paragraph here, where the facilitator then covers high level event, the, the development of events um, since, the last, <coughs> since the last passage, since the last study, and um, connects the dots from the last study, or, or could say kind of draws the story up until the beginning of this study. Then you read through the text um, once, the whole way through. Usually I did this paragraph by paragraph, just going around the circle. And after that, you discuss any difficult words that people were having a hard time with. Um, you discuss who the characters are. If you're using a whiteboard, you can write that on the whiteboard. And the really high level in like four or five sentences get somebody to summarize what happens in the story. And then the second reading, you go through it again, this time section by section, two to three paragraphs each section. Um, this is very much based on content and, and facilitator's discretion. Um, and you discuss meaning and connections with studies that you've previously done. So a little bit more like, what, is, what does this mean rather than just what is happening? And then finally, once you've gone through all of that, by that point, I often found that a lot of the study questions had actually kind of been answered. But in case, that, in case of, of a more quick um, succession through that, then I have five study questions for each study that basically nudge or prod at some like important concepts. Um, I try to have some that overlap a little bit with the the cultural things that I'm trying to point out, um, but then also draw the, the storyline of scripture um, through the study. So the most difficult part here was, was choosing which passages to do um, and how to narrow them down. It was really, really hard to limit, limit it to 25 studies and limit it to, I, I refuse to go over two pages with the study text. And so sometimes I had to cut verses or as Dr. Miller would say, murder my darlings and remove a text I really, really wanted to keep in there. <laughs> um, the anticipated length of each study is between one and a half to two hours. So it's, they're, they're a little longer, um, but I found that we were often like really hard pressed to finish in two hours just because these, we would get on so many interesting bunny trails and, and just conversations around it. So these are the 25 studies that, that I chose. Um, I won't read them all, but essentially touching on some of the high points. And a few of these may be a bit surprising. Um, and that's 
that's where this whole honor shame context came in and informed some studies that I would have been like, that's got to be in there. For example, the, um, the sacrifice of Isaac. I was like, mm, it's really important. It totally could be, but it doesn't need to be to, to complete the storyline. Um, whereas the Babel and call, to Ab call of Abraham right next to each other, that concept of making a great name for somebody is huge for honor shame cultures. Um, some of them, not all of them are explicitly honor shame, but some of them are just the, the important themes that kind of complete the, the bigger picture of the storyline of the Bible. All right, and then for each, for each study, I had this one pager of facilitator notes. Um, and basically what I did with this is just it's, it's mostly interpretation, connecting with previous studies. Um, and the, the reason for this is for the facilitator to, to read this, to read this before leading the study and to um, kind of do three things. One is make these meta-narrative connections and kind of make sure that those are, that the facilitator understands those so that those connections can be made in the study. Second is to explain important details and context, um, like background context. Uh, for example, here is an example of this, is explaining that for Jews and some cultures today even, lepers, people with abnormal genital discharges and corpses were all considered ritually impure and contact would result in some kind of separation or banishment. Um, an example of the, of the top one, the, the meta-narrative connection, is connecting Jesus' 40-day fast and desert temptation narrative back to the Israelites' 40 years in the, in the desert where they failed to trust God to provide for them. And back to the first temptation in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve failed to, to withstand the tempter. This shows how Jesus is both the better Adam and the better Israel in the storyline of Scripture. And then finally, the, the, third, uh, the third reason for this is to discuss some more difficult theological concepts. Um, for example, explaining atonement with the story of the Lamb's death and blood at the Passover and how this kept the people within this house safe and, and what was happening there. So then on the, on the study part of this, um, I am really, really grateful to my core group of participants, Matt, Matt Shen, Xi uh, Ping, and Mei Zhang for their faithful attendance, encouragement, and important input in the studies and ideas that I was processing. I couldn't have done it without them. So here I have a short video from Xi from, uh, Ping. Uh, my wife uh, and I uh, learned the Bible from Maven for almost a year. Uh, we learned a lot of s the stories of Bible from the very beginning of the creation. Uh, we learned the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, the story of uh, Abraham, Noah, Moses. Uh, no one is perfect except uh, Jesus. We learned uh, the story of the of Jesus' birth and uh, the story uh, about uh, Jesus taught. Uh, uh, his disciple uh, gospel um, and uh, uh, finally Jesus was nailed on the cross he died for all for the people of all the world 
uh, three days after he rose from the dead. Uh, the Bible is about uh, love the God and love each other. Um, from the uh, Bible study from Melvin, I benefit a lot. And I benefit a lot uh, on my journey of belief. I'm ready to baptize in near future. So I just sent him sent him a just a message the other day, like, hey, do you have any like review? And it's like sent this back in like ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so from here, um, this project has been a great mix of intense study, academic research, engagement with God's Word, and real-world practice. Not only was it a great culmination of my time at Sattler and something I wouldn't have dreamed of doing beforehand, but also it has been a great primer for the future. I'm confident that I will continue using this Bible study, though it still needs a lot of refining, and I'm excited about digging deeper into a lot of the biblical themes that I barely scratched the surface on. So there's a, there's a few big uses for this, is um, Tim and the India team hopefully will be able to use this in right. India. Um, I'm still finishing with the current group that I'm with and hope to continue using this in the future. Um, and then I think that honor shame is a really important concept for the Western church. And some of my research showed that the West is actually becoming more and more of an honor-shame culture. Um, and then, like I said, this is just a launch pad into more biblical themes. So finally, Revelation 22, 3 to 5. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Redeeming God's name. Thank you.